Just some logistics about EKG that you have to know in order to start your analysis. So just some common things you need to know about EKG and some misconceptions. Uh, one, let's talk about the paper and the ink real quick. Uh, the height, I've already talked about, but the height is measured in millimeters. Uh, pull out, if you have it, the potpourri packet that I gave you a long time ago. And if you don't happen to have it, make sure you bring it today. And uh, if you still don't have it, <laughs> look at somebody who has it, just so you can see what it is that I'm talking about as I go. That's not it. You really don't need it other than just to look at, so you can look at your shoulder. Even if you have your shoulder. Can I look at your shoulder just for the heck of it? Sure. Do you have, do you have it? I do. So when you're, when you're looking at that, you note that it's a grid. You note that there are little tiny boxes, there are slightly bigger boxes, and then at the top there's hash marks. Yep? Yeah. Okay. So the height on the little tiny boxes are measured in millimeters, and it is a millimeter. So as you go up, it's measured in millimeters. And that millimeter is linearly related to the amplitude of that electricity for that heart, for that particular person. We can't make any determinations on the amplitude between patients, from one person to the next, from one person to the next. We can't say that, hey, this person has a five millimeter QRS complex, and this person over here has a seven millimeter QRS complex, so therefore this second person has more electricity going on. That we can't do because we have to take into consideration impedance, how much muscle you have, how much fat you have, how much, how large your heart is compared to everything. So it's, it's proportional. So for that person, in a given person, then the amount of millimeters is proportionally related to the amount of electricity that's happening. So if I see a small little P wave right next to a large QRS complex, you can say that that QRS complex has more electric electrical activity going on than that P wave in that patient, in that same person. Does that make sense what I'm saying there? Yeah. Okay, so it is linear in that person, meaning the height of the millimeters is exactly related to the amount of electricity happening for that one patient. We just can't compare one patient to the next. Um, so that's measured in millimeters. They are squares, so north and, um, north and south is millimeters and uh, east and west is millimeters, but we don't measure in millimeters east and west. The unit that we're using is time as it goes from left to right, and that time is measured in milliseconds or 0 .04 seconds per little box. So it's measured in time. Every little box is 0 .04 seconds. There are five little boxes per large box from left to right, and it's a square, so north to south also. But if there's 0 .04 seconds per every little box and five little boxes per big box, then how many seconds transpires in a big box? 0 .2. 0 0.2 seconds, good. And how many point twos do you have in one? Five. So therefore, how many large boxes do you have in one second? Five. 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 Good. How many little boxes do you have in one second? Twenty-five. Twenty-five. Good. Okay. So time is on the x-axis. Amplitude is on the y-axis. The x-axis is measured in seconds, 0 .04 seconds for every little box. The y-axis is measured in millimeters, one millimeter for every little box. Okay, um, the EKG paper is gonna pass under the pin at a rate of 25 millimeters per second, which is why we can get um, 0 0.04 millimeters per every little box, right? Because you just told me that there are 25 little boxes in one second, yes? So it means it's moving at 25 little boxes per second and 25, when you divide the one second by 25, you get the 0 0.04. So every little box is 0 0.04 seconds, every big box is one millimeter, every big box is 0.2 seconds. 
And there'll be times where we're going to talk about it in seconds, and there'll be times that we talk about it in boxes. So sometimes when you're, when you're analyzing an EKG, um, you need to know time, and you need to be specific on the time. And other times, you just need to know that it's a range, and so you just lose boxes, right? Like, for example, the PR interval has to be within what time frame? 0.12 to 0.02. 0.02. You're close. Sorry, 0.2. There you go. Sorry. Okay, so 0.12 to 0.2, right? That's our range of time. If we don't care about the actual measurement of time, and sometimes I will, sometimes I want you to care about that time because I want to see that you're doing it correctly, and other times I just want you to know that they're within that range. Does that make sense? So what's 0.12 would equate to how many little boxes? And 0.2 would equate to how many little boxes? Or one big box. Big box. So therefore, when you're checking the PR interval, if you're just doing a check on the PR interval and you don't care that it what the actual time is, you just want to do a check on it, then you just make sure it's between three to five little boxes. Does that make sense? Make sure it's between three to five little boxes, and then make sure it's the same for all of them. Okay, so sometimes we care about time, and sometimes we do not. Uh, okay, uh, you notice up at the top little hash mark, the hash marks up at the top, how many large boxes are within a hash mark? 15. So how much time is going by? 30 seconds. Three seconds. So on all of those that I just gave you, how many hash marks have you seen at the top? Three total. Three total. One that starts it, one that ends it. So how many seconds is going by? Six. Okay, that's a standard way for us to look at single leads. A standard for us to look at single leads are in six second strips. I will tell you, wholeheartedly that that is not adequate for a lot of rhythms we look at. But for a lot of rhythms we look at, it is. So it's the minimum time frame that you want to look at a single lead to be able to get enough information for you to then do an analysis on. Does that make sense? And we choose six seconds as opposed to say seven or five or eight because six nicely tucks into 60 seconds. And all of the stuff that we do, everything you've learned up till now, when it comes to timing of your patients, are done in minutes. Does that make sense? So it easily tucks into a multiplication factor that we can do to establish things like rate and rhythm, that kind of thing. Does that make sense? Questions on that? Fantastic. OK, there is an error on this picture, which I'll come back to in just a minute. But so just look at this one over here. Every little box being 0 0.04 seconds, every large box being 0.2 seconds, every height being one millimeter. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. I disregard the 12 lead portion for just a moment, if that's if there's an error. Um, at the end of your 12 leads and at the end of some of your other ones, sometimes at the beginning of them, so either at the beginning or at the end you will see this rectangular box. See that rectangular box that starts it mm -hmm. over here? Yes? That's a calibration box. You do need to pay attention to the calibration box to make sure that you're calibrating correctly. All of our monitors, unless we've modified them, all of our monitors should default to a standard calibration. They should default to a standard calibration. We can change that calibration within a given patient if we need to see some things. So um, you'll either see the standard calibration, which is a rectangle that is exactly 0.2 seconds in time on the x-axis and 10 millimeters on the y-axis. So it's twice as high as it is wide. It is sometimes where we will see a slight difference in the calibration where sometimes we'll see a notch halfway through the calibration box, or sometimes we'll see the box being twice as long in terms of time, but the same height. And those are calibration differences that we sometimes plug into it so we can more adequately see what the, what the patient is actually doing. So in this case, 
we have a half standard calibration. There will have this little half step that happens in there, and it's that half step is half the width of the standard box. Okay. In this particular case, what we have is that we have, in some people, because maybe they don't have a whole lot of impedance, or depending on what electrically is going off the heart, we sometimes look at our EKG, and we will have QRS complexes from the second line down that are running into the QRS complexes on the upper line or the bottom line. And so when we're looking at that, we see a whole bunch of stuff, but we can't actually see where the QRS complexes start and end, amplitude-wise. And so we will pop in a half calibration standard, which keeps the timing left to right the same, the time is the same, but it makes the QRS complexes half the height that they're supposed to be. Not just the QRS complexes. Everything. Everything, everything electrically is half the size amplitude-wise as it's supposed to be, but time is still ticking away like it's supposed to. Does that make sense? So any of our measurements on rate would still be accurate in the same method that you're going to learn in just a few minutes, but the amplitudes will all be half the height that they're supposed to. So anything that I talked to you about, about how to measure for hypertrophy or anything like that would have to go out the window because the amplitude wouldn't be the same. Proportionally, it would be the same, but you'd have to do that, you'd have to do that calculation on your own. You'd have to do that adjustment, and you'd have to know that that's the case. Okay? Conversely, we might have a time where we calibrate it to, um, to have the paper run twice as fast under the pin. If the paper is running twice as fast, so if this is the speed that it's normally going, this is my pin, and the paper is running this fast under the pin, if we speed up the paper, what's it going to do to the rhythm, to the ink that's on the paper? Widen. Yeah, it's going to widen it out. It's going to slow down the ink overall by speeding up the paper under that pin. So this happens in rhythms that we have that are going so fast that we can't really see a separation between them. We, we can't find out where, for example, where the P wave is ending and the T wave is beginning. It's really difficult to see what's going on. We can't even tell if there's little things within the QS complexes that we want to be able to see. And so we can calibrate it to um, half speed. So the paper goes faster, but the rhythm slows down. And we can see just a little bit more of what's going on with that rhythm in that case. Good. <clears throat> Fantastic. <laughs> Questions on that? In this case, the amplitude is not changed. So any of the any of the criteria that we're doing for hypertrophy or any of the criteria that's related to how much electrical activity is happening amplitude-wise is fine for us to measure, but we'd have to make an adjustment to the rate, right? Because the rate would actually be twice as fast as whatever our measurement tells us it is. Does that make sense? All right. There you go. On a standard 12 lead, on a, on a standard 12 lead, I say standard because it's possible for this to be changed a little bit. We can either force it to be changed, or we can have units that will automatically come out different based on the unit that it is. But under most monitors and most EKGs, this will be the standard uh, way that a 12 lead will be written. So an EKG will come out with this manner, where we have leads 1, 2, and 3 on one, on one angle. We have ABR, ABL, ABF on the second column, V1, V2, V3 on the third column, V4, V5, V6 on the fourth column. And it just comes out that way under, in most circumstances. Many EKGs would then also give us another strip at the bottom. Depends on how much money you paid for your monitor. Mm. Another strip on the bottom that is whatever strip we want it to be. You can, you can make that be whatever one. But the whole strip is the same thing. So a lot of people default to letting it be lead two. I don't really think lead two is necessarily the best one to put there, but it doesn't really matter. They'll just default it to be one strip all the way across. And it just helps us to um, visually see the field a little bit better. And I'll give examples of that as we go. So they're always lined up in the same way. 
all 12 leads will come out in this way unless they are physically changed for some reason. Uh, the hospital, uh, depending on what floor you go to, the hospital will have some EKGs that have actually all 12 in one big long line. And, they're, and they have it all, all together in that manner. In which case, it's almost always in the same order. One, two, three, A, B, R, A, B, L, A, B, one, B, two, B, three, B, four, B, five, B, six. Just all 12 together. That's a possibility too. Pre-hospital monitors will always print out this way unless we force it to change in some manner. Good? Whether or not you have the bottom rhythm script is just completely dependent on the manufacturer and the monitor that your agency chose to buy. What that means is that on an EKG, everything from north to south is happening simultaneously. That event, because time is our x-axis, everything that happens on this line, on this vertical line, happened at the exact same moment. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So if there is a P wave here, and a QRS complex here, what does that mean? The QRS is coming on top of the P wave. The okay. ventricles are contracting on top of the atria. If there's atria. a P wave here in lead one, on this red line, and a QRS complex here on the red line in lead two, what does that mean? Different views. I realize I'm asking a trick question. There should be. It's an impossibility. There should be. Yeah. Right? Yeah, Unless you're something wrong with your heart. Unless it right. started from the AV. Yeah. Whatever happens right here has to happen right here as well. Unless there's a baby. Unless you have another living, <laughs> unless you have another living organism. There you go. Unless you have another living yeah. organism yeah. that is jumping on top of us. <laughs> but we'll start. I knew it was possible. <laughs> we'll, we'll start with what I said last week, which is we're assuming that everyone's normal first. <laughs> Not good. Okay, so what happens if I have a P wave right here, what I said before, and I don't see anything right here in lead two? Lead one shows me a good, clean P wave. Lead two doesn't show me anything at all. What do I know is happening in lead two in that same time frame? The camera angle just didn't see it. That's exactly the same picture. The camera angle just didn't see it. That's right. It just means that that camera angle could not see that electrical activity. That's all it is. It means something was either in the way of that camera or the electrical activity was not um, going in such a direction that that camera was able to see it. That, that's all it means. But it could be a problem, too, if there's something that's blocking there might be a the ability for it to There might be a problem. It. But what we do know is that if you see a P wave right here, the P wave represents what? Atrial depolarization. If atrial depolarization happened right there, what happened right here? Atrial depolarization. Atrial depolarization also happened right there. The lead two camera just couldn't see it for some reason. That's all it is. But everything that happens has to happen. This is, by the way, the benefit of the 12 lead right here. Right? Because sometimes you're going to look at a single lead and it's going to look, I, I can't see anything. I can't see what's going on here. I don't know what's going on. So you just look at another lead. Another lead will show you what's happening at that exact same time, no matter what. Right? So it's just a matter of being able to see it that way. Good. Um, so when we look at this, it, it tells us a lot of stuff, right? It lets us be able to measure these intervals a little bit better. So I can't, if I'm looking at lead one, and I'm trying to say, I've been asked to get a good measurement of the PR interval, for example. But the P wave looks weird. Or maybe the start of the QRS complex looks weird. Or maybe that lead is, is not showing me a good P wave for some reason, and I'm just not seeing things very clearly. I can just move to a different lead at that same time and get my measurement. So that means I can then use any PR interval anywhere in that EKG to get my actual measurements. Find the one that looks the best. I can find the one that looks the best. Same thing with my QRS complex. If I'm trying to find my measurement of my QRS complex to find out if this is a narrow or wide QRS complex, but something funky is about the QRS complex in lead one, 
Well, then look at the QS complex in lead two or lead three and find out if you can see the measurement better in one of those leads. Does that make sense? It gives you the opportunity to look in other leads because you know that what's happening in another lead is happening at the same time as the lead you initially looked at. It becomes very important for you to start making various measurements and be able to see things. It helps us to see premature complexes a little bit better. Um, if we see aberrantly conducted beats, which means a beat that is um, taking a path of electrical activity that's different than normal, we can start to see that a little bit better when we start looking at more than just one lead. Which is why in the last class I said to you that I want you to try to wipe away from your memory the way that TV shows you EKGs, right? This nice rounded upright P wave, this nice full Q, R, and S complex, QS complex, and this nice rounded T wave that's upright is just not, that, that's not okay for you to kind of think that that is normal because it depends on the picture you're looking at and I want you to be able to see what is normal in any of the pictures. Okay, okay in terms of tools, there's a variety of different tools uh, that you can use to measure EKG. You're gonna be allowed to use two of them in this class. One will be calipers, so you should start bringing calipers to class um, every, all the time now. And one will be the ruler that I gave you. The straight edge that I gave you. What you won't be able to use will be any of the rulers that give you added information. Like I'm not going to let you use an axis wheel because you're going to learn how to measure the axis and identify the axis without the wheel. So you're not going to be using an axis wheel and I don't want you to use rate calculators or anything to that effect uh, because I want you to learn how to do that and then just do it. Good? And you won't be able to use any of the tools as you move on either. Um, you're welcome to use them on scenes and that kind of thing as you're moving into, into the market, but you have to be able to know how to do it first. So we learn how to do it first and then go. Question. Question. Okay. Questions so far. All right. Your calipers, you should have gotten 